And there we are. Hopefully we are live. Good evening, folks. Hope the audio and video is coming through okay. Microphone seems happy on my end. How about all you? Let's see who's lurking this evening. If uh, Oh yeah, it looks like the list is updated a bit. Um, and W Games, Arsus, Darius, Guillaume, Infinisil, Mackle, uh, Pornipimp, Talal, uh, Traplol, and a boss. Good evening. And I was just uh, I was just running around the flat because someone's mentioned um, uh, Pondervik was just mentioning um, inside the machine, and I know I have that book, but I'm not sure where. Uh, otherwise, I could thoroughly pimp it up on the screen here because it is from what I've read so far is really good. It's it's got my pile of ones I've started but haven't been able to dig in, uh, dig too far into. Um, let's see what else is going on. Yes, so I was away. Why was I? I was away last week, I think. Everything's getting a bit jumbled right now because I know, like the the goal is at the end of next month we'll be doing our Kickstarter, so stuff is starting to pile up. Um, we're further behind than we wanted to be on getting people into the alpha, and there's just lots of moving parts. And I'm hitting my keyboard. Um, so yes, that's uh, that was the oh yeah the gig last week. Oh yeah, it was the um, P Floyd, who were phenomenal. Um, yeah, I had a really really good time. Like big. Floyd fan. More of the like kind of from the later stuff is really my bag. So uh, kind of division bell and momentary lapse of reason and stuff like that. Oh, so good. So that turned me into a massive. Um, yes, I, I became with it, with the correct amount of Pink Floyd. I become a machine that turns gin and tonic into uh, tears very very efficiently. So um, yeah, that was glorious. And yes, what else is going on? Um, Everything's coming through okay. And Fiano, good to see you, man. Um, right, so the goal was we were going to be hacking on the compiler a bit because I didn't get organized to do something else. And we do have some of that stuff here. Um, and there's been some progress recently with the traits implementations and things like that. But I'm, I'm trying to think of how to get to this. When I was messing with this recently, when I originally was implementing it, I was using load forms a lot. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys have seen those. It's one of those kind of nice, one of those features I really liked from Common Lisp, but now I'm kind of worrying more about the implementation details. So there's this thing you can do. Let's see if I can find an example somewhere. Dun, 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 dun. Um, or we could, I suppose we could just define a new type here. We can do def class example. And it's gonna have a slot called foo, and it's in it form is gonna be one. And we'll give it an init arg um, of foo. Right, so we have a type. And we can go and make an instance of our example where foo is 12. We've got an instance of that grand. Um, we're now going to make a macro called uh, Desi. Um, and what's it going to do? Well, it's just take a number. This is going to be it's going to be pretty useless. Um, it's going to define a function um, called foo, which takes no arguments, and it's going to return an instance um, of example. But we're going to make that instance at compile time. So e is going to be whoop, this. Now, in fact, let's pass in what the value will be. We'll do x, and we'll do that here. Um, and then we just do this. Now, that means if we write testy here and pass in 31 and macro expand it, you can see that we've got the uh, generated code, defun foo, and we have the object in the code that we've generated. Now, when we compile this, it's going to complain. It's like, it doesn't know how to dump an instance of this type. Um, into the kind of compiled code. We, we can't treat it as a constant. There are lots of things we can use as constants, like lists and ints and all this kind of stuff, and vectors, um, but we can't do it with this. So there's a thing called make form. So you do def method, make form, if I remember correctly. Is that the way it's done? No, make load form, sorry. Yes. And we're gonna take the object, we're gonna specialize this on the example. And we're going to have an optional env. And we're just going to declare that we ignore the env for now. Um, 
And then we're going to tell Commonless how to recreate this object. Um, so what we can do is we can basically do something like this, where with slots foo. Oh, oh, right. So we get our object in. We find the value of foo, which is the only thing we really need to know to be able to recreate this accurately. And then we return code to make the code to make a new instance um, that is similar to the original. And then common lisp can do a bunch of things. Well, when I compile this now, notice this actually compiled fine. And if we run the foo function, we get back um, that instance. Notice that we can run the foo thing multiple times. We get back the exact same instance. It's now, um, yeah, it's now kind of, come, well, what do you call it? Um, the kind of primitive types of language. What the fuck am I thinking of? Um, anyway, yes, uh, it, it, it can actually be, um, oh, there's a, there's a specific term for this um, kind of thing. Um, and it's gone right out of my head. But anyway, it allows you to put objects in the generated code from macros and they get stored into the facile, I assume. Um, and it also does some other kind of cool things. If we go and look at the definition in here, it has a bunch of information um, about this. And it creates and returns one of two forms, a creation form and initialization form. I won't go into too much about those at the moment. Um, let's have a look. Creation form is a form that when evaluated at load time should return an object that is equivalent to the original object. Uh, the exact meaning of equivalent depends on the type of the object and some other things. Um, literal objects, that was the term I was going for, literal objects. Um, so we can have objects, literals in the compile code. And so I, I, again, I'm pretty sure we can have vectors and things like this. I think, um, can we have hash tables? I'm not really sure about that one. Um, but yes, and that's one of the reasons why um, oh, it reminds me of um, like in Python, you're not meant to have a dictionary in a keyword argument because it's a um, it's an, a literal object. And then every time you call that function, it's actually talking about the same dictionary in memory. And so it like accumulates every time uh, you call slightly sideways. But anyway, yes, um, but it's a really cool little feature. Um, I really liked it. I really do like it. But um, and, and there's there's some really interesting. Whoops, that wasn't the thing I was looking for. Um, I wanted to bring out one. It's not memory. It's not that. I thought it was going to be EQ. Um, I suppose I can actually demonstrate the uh, the thing that I'm failing to find in there. Um, Let's redefine testy to return a list of two E's, right? We recompile this again and we run foo and we get two, obviously what we expected, a list of two of the same object. But that means something rather special. It means that it knows, um, it keeps track and that any time it, you, you have the same object being ripped, written into the facile, it will result in the same object here. So when this, this doesn't just get converted straight into make instance example, blah, 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 because otherwise it would be calling make instance twice. It knows that this one is going to be the same, like this one is going to be the same as this one. And so it keeps track of that um, behind the scenes. That's really cool. But there could be a cost to this. And one of the things I was seeing was I was using these um, load forms all over the place in in Checkmate, the uh, part of the, well, actually I was using it loads in tables as well. Just any time I was um, defining types and functions, I was actually storing um, types in the facile. I was compiling them down and throwing them in using um, make load form. And compiling was taking quite a while. Let's just go for an example here. Um, I would compile this file, which has a bunch of stuff in it. Um, Let's just compile that again. Blip. So that was pretty quick. Um, when I was doing that, when all of these were producing, um, were, were using load forms, this was taking about 10 seconds. 
it got really bad and it was big due to the fact that I mean it's partially my fault because the objects in, um, involved were rather complicated because they were types and they could have references all over the place and like we were kind of looking at before this system um, keeps track of those objects I wish I could find the actual um, bit that makes that promise and it's really good let's have a look through actually because it's really worth finding um, there may not be any circular dependencies in creation forms you can use they have a separate initialization form which can be used to set things up so you can have you can serialize effectively these circular reference objects it's really cool um, up, 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 um, oh my goodness There's some things going on in chat and I'm gonna get there very soon uh, the creation form for an object is always evaluated blah 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 no not this each initialization is evaluated as soon as possible um, that's not it Oh, if someone can find the line where it's talking about um, if the same object is, let's say, serialized for now in multiple places, um, then it will result in the same object next on the actual load. Ah, oh, where is it? Anyway, yes, I have some fairly complex objects uh, being stored because my type objects have a lot of information in them and a lot of references to other types. Because if you're serializing, let's just go for an example here. So uh, T type of, is that correct? No, not T type, it's just T type of. Tables, function, I8, um, I16, to Boolean. Right, so then we've got this type object here um, where it actually stores the type objects of the argument types and of the return types. So these aren't just symbols. Each of these are their own type object. If I walk all the way in here, um, you can see that this, these have circular references in them. They have references to their specification, which is another object that also was um, serialized in the same way, or I can't remember what the term is. Um, Again, hash tables also were included. I mean, basically, all this stuff got written down, and it got rather expensive. And it got me thinking, this is a massive diversion into a very simple thing. Using this feature meant the compiles were taking quite a while. And so what I ended up doing um, was just, um, well, in this case, I just actually <laughs> just do things at runtime. Do I have an example around here? No. I need to find record. Actually, we still do it here. There's, an, there's a spec here. Uh, this still has a load form somewhere that will need to be fixed. Um, yes. So basically what I would do is do the expansion myself um, into, say, in the case of our example before, um, wherever it was, fucking hell. Um, I actually just expanded it to this form, which meant that each time it was going to create a new instance, they weren't all guaranteed to be linked together and all that kind of stuff, but things did get a lot faster. The reason I'm going on this massive ramble is that both Keppel and Vario um, use this feature, uh, the make load form um, feature, quite a bit. And we know that Keppel takes a long time to compile. When you, when like, um, well, not less Keppel itself and more libraries that rely on Keppel take longer to compile than I would like. And it's something I've been wanting to look into for a while. So what if it was related to that? Like if we take, if I actually load Keppel first, let's just do, yeah, let's load Keppel. We'll get this out of the way. Like it takes a certain amount of time. ASDF load Nineveh. Um, I'm trying to think. Maybe it'd be actually good because what I want to do is just show the amount of time this one thing takes. Um, so let's um, let's 
quick load in that, and then we'll force it to reload and we'll just see the amount of time that it takes. It's too damn long is the, uh, is the result of it. And I'm wondering if it could be related to these load forms because I do dump a lot of them. And I can guarantee, and I know as well, that they are really slow on ECL. Like, I, my compile time seems to be very linked to that on ECL. Um, and I've never done anything about it because ECL generally wasn't running Keppel stuff fast enough for it to be a viable target. But I always liked making sure it compiled for ECL. So I've got, like, I normally get SBCL, CCL, and ECL going. Um, by the way, I should really should just catch up with the chat first. It's slightly tricky this week because I'm kind of floating down here in the bottom right corner and Emacs is full screen. I haven't got another chat window on my main monitor here. So i am got to remember again to look over here. Um, yes. Um, Darius is saying... About the Python thing, yes, um, in Python default arguments are evaluated at compile time. Bam. Um, I can't say on M. Um, <laughs> no, number one baggers firm. I'm going to have to find an acronym for you, sir, because um, that's just weird saying that all the time. But thank you very much for the compliment. Um, I'm glad you're enjoying the content. That's really cool. Um, da -da -da -da. I haven't been lingering enough on, um, like, basically, this, us, who kind of regularly turn up for these streams, we don't have a, um, an IRC or anything like that of us of our own, and that's fine, there's not that many of us. Uh, but yeah, do hang out in a bunch of places. Lisp Games is probably the place I'm most, um, but I, even that I haven't been on much recently. I've got to get in the habit of getting on there again, because I really enjoy it. Um, let's have a look. Lots of comments on the name. Terrace says, if you're my well-known uh, number one fan of Pondapimp, how convenient. <laughs> I want to fight you for that title, man. Pondapimp's awesome. Uh, nobody's Lemons. His acronym is No BF Feels Bad. <laughs> Aw. Um, yes, come here every week. So that's what I'm wondering. Maybe we kind of derail this episode even more than I originally derailed it, and we just go and see if we can speed up uh, these load times. So let's just do load system. Is this going to load fast now? See, this stuff still takes a long ass time. And I'm wondering if it could be related to these load forms. Um, as an example, I'm pretty sure they used heavily anyway. Let's have a look. Nineveh, let's just pick anything. We will go into the noise functions. Go into Perl and noise, go in here. If we expand defund G, let's just see what we have. Yes, there we go. We've got GPU function specs here. There's a GPU function object here. There's no... Oh, no, there are pipelines in... Um, in Nineveh as well. That's mainly for the texture stuff. So there's some... Like, draw textures is just a helper thing. So def pipeline. There we go. I know in here we have... Yes, there's um, some objects from Vario, which we reference directly so we don't have to look them up. Um, at runtime, because <sighs> that's the problem. Is what some of this stuff is that is going to be called many times a second. So if if we need a reference to an object, we don't want to have to look that up. Um, we want it to just be there. And by making it a literal object, that works really well. Um, so yeah, maybe replacing some of these is actually going to be quite hard. But I can see, was it one, two, three, four, five places in each pipeline uh, where we've got these objects which are being serialized is not the correct term, but whatever this thing is. So let's actually find out what the term for this is. Um, externalizable objects. Um, Literal objects compiled files. Hmm. 
Maybe we can say it's in externalized or something like this. Yeah, let's actually just look to the glossary. It's probably got something in there. Bam. Oh, uh, that's not the glossary. This might be. Let's see. Externalize. Yeah, externalize. Turn An object that can be used as a literal object in code to be processed by the file compiler is an externalizable object. So it makes it sound like the verb form of that will be to, be to externalize the object. So I think I'm going to try saying that for now, unless there is a more correct term for it. Um, The fact that the file compiler represents literal objects, objects externally in a compiled file and must later reconstruct suitable equivalent to these objects when that file is loaded imposes a need for constraints on the nature of the objects. Da, 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 da. Um, it defines the concept of similar, um, which is very important between, like, it can't be exactly the same object because the program has been shut down potentially since you re, but, but like, um, before you reloaded this thing. So it's not gonna be exactly the same point in memory. So it's not the same object, but it could be similar in that all the, yeah, all the references are equivalent and kind of, well, that's a bad way of explaining it, but hopefully you get what I'm trying to roughly arm wave out there. Okay, so yeah, we're gonna say the object is externalized. So maybe if we can reduce the number of externalized objects, um, thrown in there by our macros, then maybe we can speed up compile time. So, do we fuck around with um, our new compiler today, or do we go and have a look at some of our other stuff in Keppel and Vario and see if we can speed it up? So the choice is yours. Um, while you're thinking about that and leaving comments, I will um, go over here. I want to be saying may you emphasis uh, during the episode on the way you profile and look for bottlenecks, explain how to chase the heavy loads of compilers. I have no idea, mate. Uh, that's, a, that's a decent question. Um, the only thing in this case I was running into was I just, I had written, I had made this, um, I was starting to make this little language and I'd made a bunch of helper macros for defining things. And then I was recompiling it, and I was just seeing, like, let's go find, I would recompile, ah, this is a really bad example, but I would just see, ah, let me go find where it was before, spec3. So I'd recompile this, and when I did it, I would see each of these appearing with like a half second gap between them, so it would be bup, 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 all the way down the screen. And I was thinking, what the fuck? Because it just seems really weird that it would take that long. And the only other time I've seen it is when using Keppel and recompiling pipelines. And I always, uh, it was kind of confusing because you imagine that happening in kind of atomically, um, or at least kind of like stop the world, load of compile shit goes on and then everything continues. But we would occasionally recompile pipelines and we just see like functions and pipeline names come up here, which means that there is some kind of delay going on there. And I never understood it. But the only thing, and, that, and this, these obviously don't generate much code. There's, there's not much going on here, and I didn't think it was this. These functions weren't doing enough to be, um, like, ex they shouldn't be taking seconds. Like, when I ran them by hand, they were really, they were fast enough. They were, again, they're not optimized or anything, but they were going fast enough. So something else was wrong. And the only thing that I did in this project to a greater extent than I've done in any other project was um, using these externalized objects and make load form. Um, I was using them all over the place. And so I swapped that out and then suddenly everything got way faster and now I'm wondering what to do. Um, Jason's saying, wow, Twitch is pretty skippy today, probably lag on my end though. Yeah, it could be, man, I don't really know. Um, it, everything seems fine on my end. I am wired directly in now, so it shouldn't be any, um, Okay, other people are saying no skips at the moment. Okay, so, so far we've got a vote for compiler stuff and a don't mind. So, let's see if we can do some compiler stuff. Right, so the, but I will look into this another day and we'll try and find out if we can speed up Keppel because that's one of the things I've actually hated is how slow 
uh, compilation of libraries that use Kevlar. So if that explains it, that'll be awesome. And, and as a benefit, we might actually get ECL build times to something sane. Vimy Lisp, are you in the Norwegian demo scene? I am not. I hang out with a bunch of those people and they're incredibly smart, but um, I have not made any demos yet, so I can't claim to be that. I do go to a bunch of the parties, so um, I haven't been in a while though, but I normally, um, the ones I kind of are easy for me to get to are Tursak, which is a blast, and also uh, Source Corkin. Just great. But I, I hang out with folks from Logicoma and um, one of the chaps from XS fairly regularly and a few folks who are just, yeah, really inspiring to chat to. And also, oh, fuck, I've forgotten their group name. But uh, Sevet and Tapped, who I can't remember who they are. They've done some 8Ks on the Mac. Uh, with a bunch of physics stuff in it, which was really funny. And what were they doing recently? I know Sevot was looking at doing some Vectrex stuff as well, which would be really fun to see if he gets gets that going. Right, so there's a few little things I want to start looking into. Um, I'm not sure what order we'll take these in, but let's, um, let's break them down. So one of the things I want to do is... Um, we have um, records, which are our equivalent of structs. So here's a record here, VEC3. Um, so far in my head, the way I think this works is that a record is kind of like you're specifying an aggregation of um, some, some slots, but you're not explicitly saying how it's laid out in memory. Um, that comes later. So at some point, you're going to be defining a table. Let's just make up some syntax for that because it's not defined yet. Define table foo, and it's going to have some uh, columns. So one of the columns is going to be position, which will be a vec3, and we'll have rotation, which say if this will actually, let's do a vec2, and we'll say this is an asteroids game or something like this. So rotation will be f32. Uh, maybe have velocity, uh, which is another vec2. And then we'll um, define a query, which is going to run over this. It's ta uh, the table. Blah. Slow down. Um, it's a query over foo. I'm not really sure how the syntax for this is going to be yet. Whether it's just kind of, it's not really a select query I want to do. I want to do a kind of map or modify query. Um, so let's just say map over foo. The query is going to need a name though. Let's do this. Um, test queue is going to map over foo. Um, there's potentially additional arguments. These are going to be like uniforms. And then we are going to get weird indentation, which is fine. Let's put that down there. Um, then we might do something like saying that bell is going to be... I'm not, I'm not sure what the syntax is going to be for this, actually, because it's a tiny... Um, a mutable language, but we're going to define the outputs to be, I don't know, let's just do values. Vel is, um, no, Vel's not going to change for now. We'll say position is plus position Vel. And rotation is plus 0 0.1 rotation. So maybe this is our query. Um, and this is going to be mapped over this table. But what was interesting, and the reason that I want to uh, do things, treat records as something that can be have various layouts in memory, is because I want to be able to ask questions of things like, hey, maybe I want my VEC2 to be stored um, um, in various ways. So I might want it to be um, stored in standard 140, which comes from GL. Oh, no, sorry, standard 430 because I want to take this data and I want to push it into an SSBO and shove it up to the GPU. Um, or maybe I want it in um, SOA format. So each uh, component of the vector is in its own, it's essentially in its own array and memory. Um, things like that. I want to be able to specify this. Or maybe I just want to say the layout is the same as it would be in C or just leave it to whatever the default is. Um, because of this, well, anyway, that's, that's the kind of uh, thing I want to be able to do. 
And there is a kind of complementary thing that I've seen in LLVM, which is one of the optimizations it can do is it can take a struct and then it will kind of decompose it. I'm calling it struct dot decomposition, but I don't really know what the term is. Um, but it takes each of the slots and puts it in its own variable. And then uh, there's a bunch of other optimization passes that are going to go and be able to do more with it because it's working with a single value rather than an aggregate value. So because it might be dealing with a float, rather, no, it's, uh, what, what's a better idea? Maybe if, because it knows it's an 8-bit um, integer rather than a struct, it can start putting, um, start optimizing some of the code um, where it's doing like kind of logical operations on that integer. Um, yeah, interesting. Arazus, Ferris was in the stream before, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was. Uh, we used to, I haven't been on his stream either in ages, but highly worth checking out. Dude's super smart and working on great projects. Uh, Vimeo, Vimeo List was saying, yeah, I've been to uh, Tourist Hacking Source Cook as well. Fun seeing uh, Norwegian developers streaming. Awesome, man. Where are you based then? Ferris is fucking awesome, man. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, streaming on Thursdays was before, yeah. Oh yeah, and Laguba, dude, that, that fucking guy is so talented. Um, yeah, Tuesdays and Fridays, nice. I haven't checked out his streams. But yeah, he's, he's prodigious. I used to work with Gloom as well, which who's, again, like in everything, uh, like all the time. I don't understand how he does it, he's immense. Um, yeah, actually where I worked was um, Fuse, so it was a bunch of guys there. Um, Slemmy of Spaceballs was there. Um, uh, obviously a bunch of the, it was Outtracks originally, so the Outtracks guys are all there. It was, yeah, it was really cool. So yes, it would be kind of cool to be able to take a record and just decompose it. Um, now I'm not sure, because one of the things we're doing in our compiler is we're just inlining everything. So I'm not sure to the degree where it matters so much. Um, because one of the optimizations might be you only pass in one component of the struct to another function because you're only using that component, but we're not going to get any of those benefits there. Not sure, but it might still be worth doing. Um, and then it's a question of when to do it. So let's just, let's just bring up, let's get some code. Um, so we'll do plus vec3 one. Two, three, and another back three. Four, five, six. Right, so we get a bunch of code. Um, this is after it's gone through a bunch of passes already. So we can see that this plus um, is actually defined by a trait. Um, so I'm just gonna change this very slightly so it breaks the presentation, so I don't get the highlighting. Um, you can see that, where are we? Well, you can't actually see it, you can't actually see it um, easily here. Let me do this. Let's just do infer for tables. So this is saying we're going to run the type checker on it um, for the type system called tables. And this is the typed AST. So again, I'm going to just break that presentation. You can see that we've got the fun call, and here is the function here. Um, you can see that instead of it just being plus, it's vec3 plus, and that's because of the trait, um, the addable trait. So we've defined that vec3 plus is the addition function for vec3s. Anyway, that's that. Um, and we can see the two calls here to the uh, vector constructor. So yeah, I'm trying to think of where we want to... Oh yeah, and then, so then that uh, vec3 plus function gets inlined, and that's what we're seeing here. Um, is calls to get the z component, and then its use here. So what we could do is whenever the wherever the vec is first created, we could just create some. Um, it won't help in this case, which is funnily enough, but. Doesn't matter. Um, through A, through B, through Z. Uh, 
We could do something like this. And it won't immediately help anything, but one of the other um, things we need to be able to do is common sub-expression elimination, where you find forms that are the same in, in the same block of code and um, replace one with the other. So if we see, oh, down here we've got, we see this form is used twice, then we replace this with foo a, um, then um, redundant, the redundant binding elimination is going to go, hey, any place that's actually using this is just using foo a, so this becomes foo a and this gets removed. Um, all we're really succeeding in this doing in this example is actually just moving things up. Um, but in other cases, it might be more useful. So I'm not really sure. So it seems like the decomposition is just, we literally just make some extra variables with the various components. And then that's it. And we, we let um, common sub-expression elimination take care of the rest. Not sure. Um, really cool. Norwegian from Bergen. Nice, man. Volunteered for the gathering. Oh, man, I've been to the gathering for ages. That's really cool. Um, so you've been writing a lot of closure. And oh, you've been playing with Highlang. Awesome. Wait a second. I might have actually met you. <laughs> I was chatting to someone about, about Highlang at Sorskogen a couple of years ago. Went down to the lake there and we were just gathering about that. That was great. Um, <laughs> if that is you, that's awesome, man. Oh, great. Well, there we are. <laughs> hey, welcome to the stream, man. Right. Um, it's a good lake. Get there, Darius, sort it out. Work it. Right. So yeah, this, this is all kind of, um, I wrote these things down as stuff to do and we haven't done any coding and we're half an hour in, this is ridiculous. So what else needs doing? Um, the make and, um, and and all special forms, the reason I wanna do that is because there's some optimizations that just go from rearranging um, it won't be and and all though, will it? Uh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure about this. I know I want to um, pay attention to logical um, logical operations because there's a lot of optimizations we can do there that will help ourselves. Um, this one's also interesting. Let's bring up an example for that. There's probably one around here. Come on, where are we? Really? No? Okay. Funkle, if I'm just gonna um, e, this is gonna look a bit weird, but construct. I think we can do this. Um, I'm using this construct thing to. It's just. Oh yeah. Let's just, let me write the example out and then I'll try explaining what the hell I'm talking about. I8, um, x, x, so that'll square it, and this will add it, and then I'll just pass in 10. Cool, right. So, the reason I'm using construct here is all it does is it says, hey, I'm just gonna trust whatever you've shelved here is a valid expression, and I'm gonna give it the type Boolean and just fucking ignore the rest of it. And the reason I did that is because if I put true here, it's going to remove the if, and we'll just get the function. Um, there, would, there would have just been the lambda there, but then it inlined the lambda because it could see it was in the fun call. Oh no. Oh yeah, no, it did inline that lambda and we got all the way down to the multiply because that's a trait became the specific multiply for 8-bit integer 
And yeah, we just got down to the expression. And it inlined the constants as well. Okay, yeah, so that's why, because otherwise it will just reduce everything down. So by doing this, it doesn't know which Boolean it is, so I just, yeah, it doesn't fold everything away. So the reason this is interesting is because we are going to be generating at some point SS, um, so SIMD code out of this. And when you're doing uh, conditionals in there, what you do is because you're doing four things at a time, you can't um, pick the branch. Uh, you can't just pick one branch because two of the things, um, two of, like say if we're doing some comparisons with floats, say that some float value is less than 10. Well, two of the floats might be less than 10, two of them might be higher than 10, which means you're gonna to have to do both sides of an if. You're gonna to have to do both branches. And so what you do is you create a little mask with ones and zeros to say which lanes are gonna be modified by the following operations. So you, the, um, the kind of test for the if creates that mask, and then you go through the, the else, no, the then branch, um, and then you invert the mask, and then you go through the, um, yeah, then you go through the else branch. So, when we have cases like this, where we have a fun call, um, which is based on the result of a conditional, what we could actually do is we could effectively rearrange this into this. Right? Um, oh yeah, we've got ft, but um, we could do this, which is actually just going to make the transform into SIMD code a bit easier because we're not dealing with passing functions around, we're just dealing with function calls. So yeah, that, that seems a bit better, um, but there's a few difficulties with that. This case was really trivial um, because we can just push the fun call and the arguments down inside. Um, but there's also some other cases that get rather um, rather funky because let's twist it around this way. Let A be this. Uncle A blah 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 blah. 10. Um, we can push this up, um, but all of these arguments um, suddenly become important. Um, this one's fine because it's constant, but what if it's B and what if B is computed after A? Like, then we're doing, we can reorder, but there's nothing that says, whoops, how many things could be between here. And this might be dependent on some of those things. This could, there could be a J in here that is a load of code, and this might be 10 plus J. And this is fine so far, but if we're going to start lifting the fun call inside here, um, then things become a bit weird. And we also have the possibility that this lambda is closing over some variable, at which point I don't really know what to do. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure how I want to handle that transformation yet, um, but it's one we've got to keep in mind. So there's that as well. Um, Some people chatting about wanting to be able to um, do Lisp in their day job, and yeah, that would be that would be nice. I, I would like. I'm still uh, there's still some things I would love to have in. They don't really fit in Common Lisp, but I just want in the programming language I'm using a lot. Some of this stuff, basically, being able to talk about data layout and shit. Anyway, um, what do we do now? Okay, so common sub-expression elimination. That would be really useful to get. So let's just. Let's come up with a really stupid example and just make a toy that can do it. So minus um, A and B, um, minus A, B, and not there. Let A is 10 and B is 20. And I just realized that this is not going to work as an example because it's going to go and inline those values everywhere. And that's not, I mean, it'll work. It'll work for what we're doing, but I actually didn't want it to do that. Um, and I mean, this is still a common sub expression, so it's worth removing. Okay. We'll start with that and then we'll 
play with some more. Alright. Okay, so we... I actually need to be able to show you one more thing as well because we're diving into this compiler. I haven't really given you a tour at any point. Um, but there are some basic things. So let's take this and do an infer on it so we can get the typed AST. This is the first step that we do. Um, we do a type inference on the code, we find out all the types, and then we kick it across to this thing called AST to IR. So this gets it into our internal representation that we use inside the compiler, and it comes out looking like this. Um, this looks like code, but it's not actually. It's a graph of objects, um, and I'm gonna talk about those objects now. So if we go to stage zero dot list, we can see a bunch of these objects here. And these are everything in this immediate representation is one of these. Um, there's the SS, when you see um, this double S sad, um, I was actually thinking it was single, like, so there's a thing called single stack static assignment, um, which is basically every form is only um, bound to a variable once. Um, and there's no mutation or anything like this. So you don't get um, let A equals 10, then let A equals A plus B. Um, those are all going to have separate names. And actually, what might not be obvious here is this is actually how this code looks. Let's just, wow, come on now. Oh yeah, just a heads up as well. I have no, I, I have very, very little experience dealing with compilers. So please tell me if I'm wrong, if I'm using terminology incorrectly. We all help each other out and it's, it, we get better. Um, so as you can see here, we've got this very um, straightforward kind of flow here. We've got constant being bound to this expression. You can see A as being bound to the result of this. There's a lot of redundancy in this code that the passes uh, various passes clear up. Um, we have this SS, SS aid let one. Um, the let one actually is, it behaves like let star, but it can only have one form in the body position. Um, so you can see here, this is where the bindings are, this is the body form, and this is the type of the entire let. So it's really the type of the body form. Um, you have a binding. These bindings here is just a list of, or are just a list of these bindings. Um, each binding has a name, the form, and the type of the form. So each one of these, this is the name, this is the form, um, which is going to be one of these objects, and then there'll be a type in there as well. This way that I'm printing out is just printing out in a very kind of Lisp code style representation because I'm working from the REPL lot and I need to read the result of what I'm what transforms I'm doing. And this helps me. Um, SSA var, that's these ones where you can see var written here. This is where things differ quite largely from what you're seeing in this output. Because it looks like here that this is a list with a symbol in it. Uh, and that symbol is referring to an earlier binding. But that is not actually the case. This is, SSA var actually stores the binding object itself. So this is a, a dependency graph um, of data as well as being, yeah, the immediate representation. Um, you have SSA lambda, which have the arguments, which will have types, they have the body form and the result type. And if, which just has the test, the then, and the else, which are all uh, these objects, actually, the then and the else are always a let one. And that just means there's less cases for us to deal with and it's easier to do um, transforms there. A fun call has the function that it's going to be calling and the arguments. There's a constant, which just has the type of the constant and the form. So that'll be, this might be i8 and this is the number one. And then constructed is a node that is used for whenever I use that um, construct term from earlier. Where was it? So if I do infer on this, infer tables, construct here becomes construct here. And that's all that is. Let's get back to where we were. There's our inferred uh, uh, typed AST, and then we've changed it into this immediate representation. And then, well then from then on, we're just running various par passes on it. So one of the things we do very early on is we remove any redundant bindings. So like this one here, um, 
8876 is just 8878. So when we run this pass, we'll see that it's gone. 8878 is, oh wait, no it hasn't. Dead binding removal, why didn't that remove that? I'm confused. We'll see. Pretty sure that's what that one did. <laughs> Never mind. There's constant folding. That got rid of a lot. Um, that's interesting, actually. So I guess this is um, the dead binding is when it's referring to a binding that's referring to another binding, and it just removes the middle one. We'll see. I have to look up what that's actually doing. But anyway, yeah. We get constant folding and a bunch of stuff happens and then, yeah, we reduce the code down pretty fast. And this is all we're doing is just running a bunch of these passes and we need one that's going to do sub-expression elimination. So that is our job. Um, and it's taken me bloody ages to get to that point where we're there. So in here, let's make a thing for this sub-expression elim.list. Um, Let's follow the same kind of pattern we've been using other in other things. Um, where was the thing I was doing? Um, gonna write the description for this later. We're gonna have a run pass which takes in an SSA let form and then just transforms it. Um, vast bindings. Oh, okay, right. There's some transform there that I hadn't run. Um, this is not constant folding anymore. This is sub expression. A limb. We're going to need a package for this. So let's go and define that. The only thing it needs to expose is run pass at the moment. And SLM is the method we're going to be calling, and then we're just going to define that method. So def method SLM for. Actually, let's just take these. C fold with SLM. Okay, right. So these are the different nodes we've got. So these are the ones we have to handle. We're going to walk down the graph and we're going to do this elimination. Now, the first version of this What are we going to do? Well, we need to be able to turn, we need to do this in bindings, I would think. So I think when we get into this let, this is where we're going to start looking at the bindings and we're going to try and turn them into some kind of key. Maybe we just store that key in a hash table. I mean, I don't need it to be fast, the first version. I just need to come up with a mechanism that works. Um, so for every expression, we need to turn it into something we can compare. And then we'll store a map of those between those keys and the um, binding in question. So I'm going to bring up that other code as well for the other one, just to see what kinds of things I have available. Let's get those objects that we were looking at before. This Right, so these ones here. So here are all our slots that we have to work with. So I'm getting the bindings, the body form, and the type. I probably don't need the type, actually. I don't. We're not going to be changing the types of anything in this pass. Um, and each of these passes actually mutate the graph because I don't want to be creating new objects on every single pass. Uh, Mfiana is saying, 
I just bought a 5k speaker system and sub <laughs> my sub is rumbling my house due to ambient noise. Oh, just the ambient noise of my computer. Oh, that's a bugger. That's a cool system, but um, dead binding should just be an unused variable. Yeah, it might be my terminology is just bad. Um, Common comes recommending object oriented programming and common list by S. Keen. That is something I should really read. I need to do so little class work and I really should actually learn a bit. Because it'd be cool because then I could do some um, actual episodes just on what was the um, the series I'm doing, the little bits of Lisp stuff. I need to get back to those as well. God damn, there's just no time. Right. Um, so what we want to do is we're going to look for binding in bindings and we're going to do something I'm not sure what it is yet, but we'll see soon. Um, well, actually, what's it going to be? We're going to look at a binding. We're just going to say, hey, are you redundant? Have you already been seen? And if so, remove it. So then it should be... Um, well, no, it's not going to remove it. It's going to replace it with an S file. This could be its own function, actually. So let's just call... Um, what would it be? In fact, all of this can be replaced. We can just do map of nil um, of bindings and do slm again, actually, and def method. slm a little wasteful because we know exactly what the type is there, but as a binding, yeah, that's what it is. Actually, hmm, this is gonna be a little different because one of the things that could happen is, do we have to care about scope? Do we have to care about scope? Because one of the things I'm thinking of, let's have a, let's change our example a bit here. If, oh, we're gonna have another one of these constructs. Um, if, checkmate line construct, boolean, whatever is, Just trying to come up with an example where this matters. Not trying to confuse myself with this. Um, okay. So here, both this branch and this branch have common sub expressions, but you don't really want to remove this one and replace it with, like, we could move this out to, whoops, to here, right? You can't replace this one with that one uh, because it's on a completely different path. But we are gonna be compiling this to SIMD and then we are gonna be running both sides of the branches. So maybe that helps? I'm not really sure. Um, so really we want to, for now at least, keep um, a stack of these transforms and we want to pass that down as well, which means this method is incorrectly defined. So let's go and look it up. And this is the shit I really love with common list, is we can go and just unbind that method and fuck you, it's gone, hooray. So now we need to pass down an environment. Um, and that's it, we just need to go, let's just do, I cannot remember how to do this. Something like this. That was not it. Oh, Fuck you, buddy. Oh, I actually managed to... Oh, cool. Okay, so yeah, I have got it. 
Right, let's go here and add the env. Oh, and I haven't done it for the ones down here. That's dumb. Oh, so, what are we going to do with this? Um, and what is it going to be? I mean, we could just um, just do some lists and just have an A-list that we pass down or something like this. That, that seems probably the easiest way of doing that. Um, so yeah, then this changes very slightly because then we have to have a lambda here. And then maybe it's actually just cleaner to do the do loop that we had before. So we go loop for b in bindings. Oops. Do slm uh, b and there we go. And then we also want to do slm on the body. Body form. There we go. And at the end, we're just going to return the same object because we should be mutating it in place. And that'll be fine. And then we've got this. This is the actual meat and potatoes of this thing. Um, do, 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 do. Darius is saying, Klaus made me love Oop again. That's really cool. Um, and yeah, I, I completely struggle with the kind of oop that's in Java and C++ and stuff like that. I wonder to what degree I mean, you could do something like this in one of those languages. I mean, like, say you took a language like C Sharp and then you did a kind of class object implementation. Where would it fall down? Because that kind of interests me. Because a lot of the stuff we have in class, like we also have that kind of being able to redefine types on the fly as well. If you remove that, do you still have enough benefits that it's worth it? Um, and that's a genuine question. I'd love to hear your views on that while we're here. Oh no, um, NBF is saying, I'm getting throttled so bad. Last I, last I saw was the little bits of list mentioned. Damn, man. Um, yeah, I, I need to do more little bits of list, man. Sorry I haven't been doing that in a while. I'd love to get back to it. The reason I've been able to do these uh, weekend, these uh, Wednesday ones, sorry, is just because it's so, there's, there's kind of very little planning that needs to be done to, to get started on it, because it's just a pleasure to be with you folks. Um, Pond is saying the books, Pond of is saying the books I mentioned above, and oh yeah, the one we just mentioned in the Art and Meta Object Protocol, um, made me really reconsider this part of programming. Awesome. of him saying to Darius that sometimes even the guy who implemented that system does not remember or understand what's going on. See, that's worrying to me. That like, one of the things I find intimidating in class in general is this whole method combination stuff. Um, that looks really ugly to me, and it just I I don't know how you're meant to know from any given point in your program how you could have got there, which makes it very hard to say how. It, it, yeah, it just seems. It seems difficult, especially when you throw exceptions into the mix. And I know I, I do prefer class exceptions, sorry, a common list of exceptions to other systems, but I don't know, man. If the two sub-expressions are on different paths, are they actually common sub-expressions? Probably not. Um, because there is nowhere you execute both paths and you can't make use of elimination. Well, that's the thing, in the SIMD stuff, you will be executing both paths, right? Because, well, probably. Probably. Yes, it's only a probably, isn't it? So you can't do that. You could move it outside of the if at that point. So that would be kind of like a loop invariant um, lifting, where you move the thing outside. But yeah, that smells bad. Um, Darius has linked to talk, and I'm just going to see what it is. Oh, it's the Overwatch gameplay architecture netcode video. It is awesome. Um... Yes, that's really cool. The ECS one is very impressive. Treble L is saying, how do you, um, how do I, or how do I plan to handle identifying expressions with side effects? There are no side effects in this little language. Basically, this is an excuse for me to try optimizing, uh, try and make an optimizing compiler, but I'm stripping away everything that's actually hard about it. So it's of limited value to the world, but definitely still a value to me. Um, so th there is a bunch of stuff I've removed that I haven't even got to yet. Like, 
there's no recursion, direct or indirect. There are no, um, there's no actually no iteration clauses in the language as it stands. Um, I will be introducing some limited iteration things, but the idea is that you define kind of like how it's done in SQL. You define joins and a join to yourself would allow a certain type of, um, certain kinds of loops, but it's the iteration itself isn't, there isn't a explicit um, iteration construct that you can use. Um, that makes a bunch of stuff simpler for me. Uh, no, I don't. No, no, this this little this little language is purely for data processing. I, I want it. I want a tiny because it's it's not for it's not to be used on its own. It's to be used in other programs. So the idea is that it's just a DSL um, for processing. Um, yeah, it's a DSL for generating SIMD expressions that process data, um, and in a very limited context. And it might be that context is way too small to actually be useful for anything, but I kind of think it's a fun project, so it's why I'm doing it. Um, Arasus is saying, raw compilers use these limitations too. All the optimizations are done in the SSA representation because it's not feasible to do it earlier. True. Yeah, that, that is true. Um, yeah, so the um, this case, yeah, you probably wouldn't do this. I mean, do you do common sub-expression elimination across basic blocks? That's something I haven't looked into, but technically each of these would be in a separate, each branch would be in its own basic block. So this would never really come up. But yes, so let's see, we're gonna get into the SSA binding. We need a way to take a binding and create a key. So let's do defund form key form, and then we're gonna do something with it. Um, let key is form key. Oops, I want to bring up where's our stage zero list. Right. Bindings have a name and a form. There we go. So let's go and go with slots form. Oh, and then we're going to go in here and say pass the form to form key. Now we've got that. Then we want to do an ASOC on ASOC. ASOC R is uh, just a helper function which does CUDA on the result of the ASOC because I don't want both things. I only want the right hand side of the pair. Um. Um, existing form in ASOC, we're going to look up the key in the env and then we're going to go, hey, when there is an existing form, then we're basically going to replace ourselves with that. So we've got the binding object and it's currently whatever it is. Let's have a look. The binding object is going to be this. It's got a name and it's got a form and it's got a type. The type is not going to change. The name is not. Is the name going to change? No, the name is not going to change. The form is going to change. When there's an existing form, we want to go and make one of these. Um, set up form to be made. No. Instance of SSAD var. Where binding is the existing form. And that's it. Okay, that would be what we want to do. So we just need to define this form key now and we need to then handle these other cases, which are really just passed through. Like constructed doesn't do anything. So that can just return itself. Um, Constants and symbols aren't going to do any. Aren't going to make any changes. Um, vars, in fact, aren't going to make any changes either. Fun call. We're going to want to run um, the elimination on all of the. Do we want to run it on the arguments? 
No. I don't think you do. Funkle is always either going to have constants or Vaz's arguments past a certain point in the compilation, so no, you probably don't want to run that there. So this probably can just be this. And if, yes, if have these lets as branches, so we definitely want to pass down into those. And lambda has a body, so we definitely want to pass down into that. So we're getting there. So we need to fill out this, and then we need to fill out these, and then we should have this. Um, but that's going to take, that's the actual hard bit. So let's have a look at how that works. So really, we want to be able to... Hmm. If we just take, let's just make a list. We'll use a list as a key, and then we can compare it with um, equal, this equal. Right? Let's just do type of um, form. Actually, there's be things that we don't want to look up as well as things we do want to look up. So, actually, let's do this. Let's go type case of form. We're going to look at some different things we want to do here. And we want to, we could actually implement that as methods, but I'm not going to do it for now. Um, we can say when key, then look that up. Okay, so then the type case of form, what kind of things do we want to care about? Really, it's function calls will be the big one? Oh no, I suppose. Let's start with function calls and we can work out from there. So now we know this, we can say list, this is our key, is fun call, um, and then the other things are going to be uh, based on the arguments. So let's do cons. Fun call, and then it really depends, like it's either going to be constants or vars. So let's just do, let's make a little labels here. Labels. Um, what was it? Key arg or arg key. Oops. Then you can, oh, I can't swap that. Boo. Okay. Just learning some things about Emacs, so. <sighs> so it takes an arg and it's got to return its key and that is going to be um, e type case of arg and if it's a, this is a d um, var, then it's going to be con. What are we going to say? Well, in that case, it'll be a, the internal thing will be a binding um, which is annoying to compare because we actually want to compare if it's the binding to the same place. So I think we just go slot value name from the arg. No. Uh, this is going to look ugly, but slot value arg binding. Okay, so we take the binding we look up the binding, then we look up the name, and that is going to be what we use as the key. And the other option is a constant, SSAD constant, in which case we're just going to return it as is, and it can be its own key. Um, we're going to cons funcle onto, um, well, we just do map car our key of the arguments in the. So, look, with slots, what does funcle look like down here? Yeah, don't know, break the things. Right, arcs, there we go. But, actually, no, that should be correct. Let's do that. Arcs. 
Okay. So now... What else do we need to do? Um, let's say that that might be correct, and let's check what's going on in the chat. Not much right now. So I need caffeine. And then we're going to come down here and look at Lambda. So if we look at Lambda, we can see that the body form is always an SSAD let one. So it's very easy to what we need to do here. We just go with slots body form on O. We do S elimination on O, and that's it. Um, oh no, we passed down env. So. Oh no, we're not done. We're not even nearly done. No, because we need to add things as well. So we've actually got some fun here. We can do if. If existing form do that. Otherwise. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. Okay, slight refactor here. So we're going to do when key. Um, then we do let's existing form. And then when there's an existing form, blah. Otherwise, we need to add self to the end. And that's going to get interesting for reasons. We will soon see. But let's just look at this if first. And the goal here, da, 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 da. this should be easy, right? We should be doing we should just be able to call SLM on test then announce. So with slots test then else on O SLM on Oh, let's just do this. Boop, 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 boop. No. Uh, so then on that, passing in the env. And for now, we're returning the object. I'm not sure why. We might have to change that very soon. Because. <laughs> Gaff from Blade Runner. What lisp is this? Uh, we're doing common lisp, but we're making a compiler for another little DSL, a lispy DSL thing. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at. How much facial hair do you need to become a lisp? So, um, you need enough hair that you can cover up, basically enough hair that you can no longer see the mistakes that you're making in life. All right, so. We have a binding, so let's just cons. Um, the key we've just generated for our form onto the binding itself, this is what we want to add to the environment. But currently, the plan was that the environment would just be lists um, that we could just, you know, cons these things onto. And... That means we actually want to pass it up to, the result should go up to here. So this is slightly different actually, and this is why I don't think we're going to have this be the SLM method anymore. I think we're going to rename it. So defun um, SLM binding. We're not going to pass in the environment, and we're going to do this. Wow. Oh, we do need the env. Okay. Fair enough. Let's do this. I still think it's worth calling this a different function because it's doing something slightly different to the others. Um,
NOBF is saying, I'll never be a true list for that. Oh, man. That's all right. You can pull the wool over your eyes. It does the same thing. Um, <laughs> we still accept you. That's very magnanimous of you, Pond Pimp. Excellent. Um, SLM binding. So let's do this. We can say four. And it's whatever this is. Um, new fucking thing. New pair equals. I'm not thinking straight right here. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So, set f end is cons. Oh no, we can just do push, can't we? Let's just do mutate all the things. Push new, um, new pair onto end. No, actually, we can just do push. We don't need to do push new. No need to check. Um, so, yes, is that correct? Yeah, it's push an object onto place. And we only need to do this when you pair. And because this is... Because uh, we're using loop, let's make it ugly. There we go. Do. Uh, when you pair, do push to that. Okay. And then, because of this, if we go down into an if branch, it'll take the env list off to both sides of the branches. And then if it gets down into those lets, they're gonna create, they're gonna append new things on there. So they're gonna, they're gonna be separate trees. So we don't really have to worry about them. Also, SLM doesn't really need to return anything. The only thing that does return stuff is this SLM binding. Um, and everything else is just mutating, so... Um, I think that we can just sell everything not to return stuff. And we're going to do that with values, because I kind of like values. go. That might do stuff. I will see. Well, not this case, because that case is completely useless, but let's go to our simpler case. No, it does not work. Well, fuck you then. Um, what did we do wrong? Let's have a look. Let's uh, just see what form keys we get back. So here, let's just do print, because print is easy, list, and we'll do form and key, there we go. Yeah, that's why it doesn't work, because we don't call this fucking pass. Morons. Everywhere, morons. Okay, so let's go back to um, compile, and we'll just throw it in the mix here. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Run, pass, and do this, and this, and notice this highly technical optimization loop here. <laughs> Rather than checking to see if the code actually settles down and doesn't optimize anymore, we just run these passes 10 times. And that will do for today. Uh, okay, fuck you. Excellent. So, it's complaining about something. So we are getting something new now, which is nice. Um, let's go into this lambda and jump to wherever it is. Oh, it's in... Oh, it's in sub-expressional limb, so let's go there. And it's saying invalid number of arguments, one. What? Oh yeah, there it is. Um, yeah, the pass has to return something. There we go. Okay, so it did not work. 
so let's go and find out why. Turn our print statement and we can start having fun. Okay, so, and I know one reason why it would be, because we're compiling with the wrong test. So we can see here that it is actually generating... Ew, look at this. Oh, yeah. Okay, so constant down here. Where is constant? Here. Shouldn't actually be returning the arg because... Stage zero. If we go and look at SSA constant, it's an object. What we want is the form. So... As I say, constant. Ooh, no, that's incorrect, isn't it? I think. Do we have to take the type as well? Because what if the form is... Like, what if we have two constants? One of them that's... Both of them are the number one, but one is of type I8 and one of them is of type I32. Well then... Functions are always, always already monomorphized, so I don't think that's going to be a problem. Oh, I just found another problem as well. Oh, we've got to get to that in a second. Right, never mind. We'll get there. Um, okay, so SSA constant. First order of business is we need to get the slot value, and we're going to get the form instead. So now, when we run this, then our keys should be substantially smaller. Look, fun call, 10, 20, but we're missing something rather important. The function that we're calling... So, at this point, all of the functions should have actually been inlined. So I'm hoping we can just... Uh, where's fun call? Here. We're going to append this, and then we need the function itself. We could actually just use... Hmm. I'm just trying to think of what to do with this. Let's go and have a look at what that object is in memory. So if we go into here, and we go into... Bindings and we go into Funkle, one of these form, and we go into Funk. We can see it's an SSA constant, and the form is actually just a cons. So, yes, that's the bit we want. Um, actually, if we're comparing a cons, it's going to take longer than just comparing the symbol, so let's compare the symbol. Um, or do we want to do that? What if it's not? I think. At this point, if everything would have been constant faulted into that position. So I think that's okay. We don't allow function to be passed in as uniforms. Let's just assume we can get away with it for now. So, okay, so... Doot, 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 args, and let's back out so we can see what the slots are. Idiots, there it was. Args and func. So there we go, func. And func is an SSA constant. So again, we just do form of funk. Let's have a look at that. Now our keys look like funkle, blah with a function, then this stuff afterwards. Yeah, let's try that. And then the other problem that I noticed was when we do our ASOC here, um, we don't have a way of passing in a test. So we need key tests. And the default will be, isn't it? Here's the default test for ASOC. That's kind of annoying, doesn't it tell you? Test are designated for a function of two arguments that returns generalized Boolean. ASOC, ASOC, if, blah, blah, blah. Come on, it must, must say. EQ. Doesn't say. It's probably somewhere else in the spec, but that is rather annoying. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that the default is EQL. Um and I'm gonna pass it in here. Test is test. 
And then this is test is going to be equal. Equal. God, I can't speak. And it's still not working. Fuck. Right. Let's see if we can find out why. Let's check the chat. Arasus is saying there's a lightning talk by Shanla Karuth talking about how compiler just tries inlining three times and then stops. Excellent. Yeah, you always get these weird heuristics on um, on things like that. And that's why I kind of like, I like the idea of having DSLs with very strict um, promises about what they'll deliver. Like the Bolt compiler that Unity's been working on. It's like, if it can't do the optimization, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's an error. It'll throw an error and it won't compile. So you don't get cases where it degrades without you seeing it, which I really like. Um, Pick is saying, can you do mutation in Lisp? Yes, definitely can. Um, common Lisp, that is, which we're talking about here. Um, in my little DSL that we're making, that we're, so up here in this little language that we're compiling up here, this one doesn't have mutation. The stuff here won't have mutation. Uh, but the language itself that we're writing all this in common list does have mutation. Okay, so we've got this here. I've got this here. Those look like they would com compare just fine with equal. So why why didn't it work? Or maybe it did work, let's see. Yay, that was an existing one. Okay, right, so let's take out this for a second. Oh shit, wait, what? Oh. Oh fuck, it worked. But then it, it just then constant folded everything away and I didn't notice. Okay, let's uh, let's disable this pass and just make sure I'm seeing that correct. Yeah, because we've got here, it was meant to be plus of two identical sub-expressions. And now we've got one integer minus and then two references to the same value. I think it might be working. I mean, it's dirt simple, but... So if we replace this with program... And then we do this. Yes. And then we bring it back in. Ooh! Optimized! Right, so that is really handy. Um, we haven't done it in a very smart way. Um, but it sh it's kind of clear that, like, we can at least see where we go with this. And then we can go and optimize bunch of stuff anyway. So that is kind of cool. All right. Yeah, on the subject actually of those uh, strange compiler like optimization limitations, you get things like there is a budget of amount of time or operations that can be done, maybe. So you have talk, have talk of an optimization budget. You might also see things are just not considered if they are above a certain size. So C sharp won't inline functions that are over 36 bytes, I think, or something, something like that. You get these like, we won't even consider inlining it if this. And it's like, that's really annoying because when you have inlining, one function being inlined might push you over that budget. So something that looks trivially inlineable um, and might even when it inlines gets completely collapsed and give you a really nice benefit, won't. Or the really stinky one is when you're very late in development and things have been optimized, you're like, great, good performance. And then someone spots a bug in a function that is normally inlined. And you go, oh, like, that one over there, it doesn't consider this case, so they go and fix the case. And now that function is slightly too big to get inlined, which means the other one, no, or yes, or it does get inlined, and now the other function is big. And so, uh, yeah, either inlining stops or it does inline in lots of places, and that changes, like, the number of instructions in these functions, and suddenly you're getting either bad instruction cache performance or something else. It's all kind of cool. That's why I find this stuff really exciting, even though I don't have a practical use for this, really. 
Um, it's just such a fun problem because it's fucking hard and there's no good answers. And where the hell's my cursor gone? Right, fine here. Get me on the other machine so I can actually look at chat. Yes! Mackle is saying you don't, he doesn't get, uh, oh, sorry, whoever you are, doesn't get email notification when this channel goes live. That's really annoying. I didn't know that. Um, ah, some people have turned off all notifications. That'll do it. Um, oh, why is it so fucking hard? I just want to be able to tell you. <laughs> I'm going live, especially today when I like only put the announcement up like five minutes before. Well, it was like two hours before actually going live, which was really shitty of me. Sorry about that. Okay, um, let's do something more interesting. Let's. I won't do the if because that, but if we do, well, yeah, that should. Okay, so we had a couple of things in here. So E from there. So the subtract of A and B should only have been done once. Yeah, I don't see anything that's the same here. G278. See, one of the things we need to do actually is, and this will, this will be coming later on, is that there are things here where we absolutely know the answer. Like all of these integer operations, like plusing these two, we know what the answer is. So that will become a constant, which will then get folded into this. Then all of these, we know all the answers to, they're all gonna fold away. These will get inlined, this thing will fold away, and this will just reduce down to one number. So that's the kind of stuff I want to do in future weeks. And actually, now we've kind of been on a bit of a rambling tour through this compiler, I think we can just write more stages like this. Um, this was an important one, though. And I'm actually really glad we it was really simple in the end, which is cool. Um, yeah, that's fun. Because with that out of the way, then when we do decomposition like this, this is just then when we separate them out into those variables, those are going to get pulled everywhere. Like all of the all of the places they were used are just going to get folded away. Uh, so that's really cool. Yeah, that's fun. Okay, so let's get rid of these because they're just some garbage code. Um, we'll commit. Um, Chunk dot lisp. What was that for? Oh, it's some notes from the other day. Okay, I'll deal with that soon. Sub expression elimination. Yes. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, that was something else. In fact, let's, let's unstage this and do it in the proper order. Don't be lazy. Do it properly. Fix bug in back 3 um, what have we got here? Utils, um, add test to, to asker. Very basic sub expression. Elimination. But it easily good enough for us to get some um, some real data out of it, and, and this seems to be, I think, just notes on yes, notes on other things I have to work out soon. So yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll leave those for now. I can deal with them another day. Anyway, oh wait a second, it's only twenty one thirty nine. Well, that's um. Meh. That's early. We should do something else. Because <laughs> that is just not good enough. It's not something really pressing I need to look at right now, though. So throw out your questions. I'm around for a few minutes more. I'll think of something to do in these last, the last 20 minutes. But I want to check out what you've been saying, though. 
Um, what language are you compiling, says Will Zender. I haven't given it a name. It's a little, it's what's going to be a little query language uh, for a library called Tables I'm making. They, the, it's really dumb, let me tell you this. This is an excuse for me to do some things. Like, so I've never done assembly code, uh, like x86 assembly stuff before. I've never done an optimizing compiler. And what else have I done? A whole bunch of stuff. And so, yeah, like I'm looking, oh yeah, data oriented design type programming stuff. And so I wanted an excuse and a project to play with that lets me touch on a few things there. Um, so what I want to do is I want to create, a, I want to, I want to define data in a high level language. Um, so I'm using common lisp because I like common lisp. I want to be able to have control of the layout and I want to be able to control the, to change the layout very easily. So between um, kind of whether the struct is very tightly packed or whether it's kind of in a standard C layout or whether it's SOA and all kinds of things, I want to be able to play with that. Um, when I was looking at ECSs, uh, like ECS kind of architectures, they really looked like databases to me. They like, well, not proper databases with the guarantees, but tables and columns and functions that ran over those things. Um, and then when I was looking at the data and design stuff, you've got a lot of cases where saying like where the data makes sense, having large batches makes a lot of sense when you can do SIMD code and you can run over large chunks of data. Um, and it just, like, a lot of, from, from some of the experiments I've been doing, because I do Lispy kind of um, GPU stuff most of the time, um, I was finding cases where even though I have a live coding environment, um, it was kind of, I was getting into these kind of recompile loops whenever I would change the definition of a level, for example. You would end up restarting the level to bring everything back up again, and that really sucked. So I, I liked the idea of having something I could easily query and update data in. Um, and also, when live coding large enough systems, the fact that everything was just some instance somewhere started to have a cognitive load of its own. And I liked the idea of these singleton tables, like you have in a database, you have this table and that table and they have names and you define relationships between them. Um, and there's lots of fun algorithmy kind of things you can do there. Um, and so yeah, so I wanted to, to make a compiler that optimizes some code that generates SIMD instructions and this is just a DSL that lives inside common list. So I can do all my normal high level bullshit, uh, but then I can use this for a certain subset of work and it sounds fun. And that's about it. So that's kind of where I am. So yeah, the query language for that is what I'm working on by the form. Um, Gion says constant folding. We do have constant folding. We don't have things that produce enough constants to fold away at the moment, but um, data-oriented design isn't that natural in Lisp. The way that data-oriented design is, well, how I kind of uh, relate to it is that you have stuff to get done. This is the work that you need to achieve. And you want to get and we're, 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 we want to get it done fast because we're thinking about, say, in the context of games. There's the algorithmic approaches that you can use, which are going to, which, are, which basically the algorithm stuff is how do you not do more work than you need to do, right? So let's think of really clever ways where we can do less work and get the same result. Awesome. That should be like your, one of your pillars and you're using that as much as you can. But then you have... You've done that. You have the set of work that needs to be done. It's how do I do this work as fast as this specific machine can? And you do have a specific set of machines you're going to work on. Um, whether it's, okay, it's going to be, you know, Android phones, like um, Apple devices and PC or something like this. You have a finite set of devices you're uh, deploying to. And those have actual behaviors. Then like a lot of things aren't undefined when you actually look at the device in question. And so then there's this whole, how can you lay things out of memory? How can you think about data and the, like the data that you're processing and the data that is your program, the, like the, the layout of your instructions and things like this? How do you deal with that in ways that really play to the strength of the machine? That's what I think about when I think data-oriented design. And that isn't so immediately approachable in high-level languages like a lot of the Lisps because you don't speak about, you don't have the tools to talk about exact memory layout. Um, 
doing yeah and a, a lot of the time like like when you have a number you don't know what type that number necessarily is and which is kind of good in a lot of places like you do a bunch of integer math and you end up with a really big number and it just it doesn't overflow and give you some weird result it just promotes itself up to bigger and bigger integer types that's really cool and you get the correct result it's kind of nice that the default behavior of the language is you get the correct result like if you take the square root of a negative number you get a complex number back that's really cool right that's that's useful but um, this means that the result of this computation could be two different types this one might be a float this could be a single float right here and this is a complex number which is an object so there's um, yeah it's a uh, there's a lot of things which make it harder to say specific things about what you're processing. And so statically typing stuff gives you some things, um, and then the rest is about data layout and things like this. Specification versus implementation is also not very accessible in most languages. That is true. That is true. There's a lot of things that like um, that make all that really tricky. And I, I think there's a place for like, I, I don't have the, I really don't care about like, a language like I love tools and I love like I like tools that work well together it's like having oh we need the one true hammer like no you don't you like there's probably a good selection of hammers that actually is helpful to own and it really does help that when you're using one hammer to make a shed right you're not stopped it doesn't become really difficult to switch to another hammer there are no tricky implications about switching your tools partway through construction of an object but there are so many with programming languages. The boundaries between programming languages are so fucking difficult to deal with. C is like one of the few that like, just because things know how to normally have a basic FFI to C, you can actually deal with it. C++ is obviously a goddamn nightmare. Um, Rust promises to be a bit better in a bunch of places. Um, yeah, man, it, it's, it's fiddly. Yeah, I don't know. But again, most of these projects, again, are really silly, and I just like them. 47, what should we do? Can you call C from C Sharp? Yes, you use P invoke. It's handy. I was doing some work with that a little while ago. It's not pretty. It's like CFFI in Lisp is so nice. Like, it's such a nice system to use in comparison to most other things. <sighs> it's really annoying. I wish the other ones were as good. I mean, it's not to say that it isn't, there, there aren't issues with it, there are plenty, and uh, I mean, actually a lot of the issues don't really come out of just, things are cruftier, not cruftier, they are more verbose than they need to be, than they would need to be if you were in a static language. But yeah, we're not. So yes, what to do now? Okay, so I'm going to have a quick look at... Keppel, and I want to look at what things have load forms. And I want to know how necessary it is. Compile context for pipelines. Interesting. What is this? So the goal here is just to find out, yeah, if I can find a bit out of where, a bit about where these kind of objects are being used, then hopefully I can find out. Oh, okay, this is this is putting pipeline specs. Sorry, I cut myself off halfway through there because I got distracted. If we can find out where these um, make forms are used, then maybe we can avoid using them 
or we can find out if we can yeah replace them in some other way and hopefully get some build time improvements that would be really nice okay pipeline specs now i'm pretty sure we looked at Nineveh earlier Well, it's not going to be here, is it? It's going to be in the pipeline. So let's look at the textures, draw texture. Pipeline, there we go. That's interesting. So make pipeline spec for the function is called here. The only places I'm seeing pipeline spec are Yeah, the only places I'm seeing pipeline spec are um they're, they're calling things directly. They're not um oh Come on, words, where are you? Um, they're not using the externalized objects. Well, they're not externalizing objects and storing in here, which is cool. So in that case, where is this actually needed? load form again. Ah, yeah, I know. Okay, so well, we still got that grep open. Yeah, we don't have a load form for make pipeline spec. And then I've got to wonder, where is compiled context being used that we need this? I thought it was only around here. But we can find out for another week, that's for sure. Let's see. Arasuza's, I just know that calling C from Java is really tedious. Oh my god, yes, J and I. Oh fuck. <laughs> I've forgotten about that. Oh my god. Yeah, so, okay, my last job, um, one of the things we did was to, we had a C sharp like language. That compiled to native code on um, basically on all the platforms that mattered to us. So it was desktop um, and mobile and web as well, actually. So we could compile to C++, uh, .NET, JS, and all these kind of things. And we were pretty good at that. Um, but obviously, we, we had to interface with the native ecosystem as well. So we generated, well, the first thing we did was actually generating bindings for all of Java. And that was so I was doing that, and my friend was working on generating bindings for Objective C. Yeah, so I did a lot of JNI, and that was hell. And um, yeah, so I, I know your pain. In the end, what we did is we created this thing that we just called foreign code, which you can see examples of actually in a bunch of languages these days. Which where you basically had an attribute, you have like a C sharp function or a C sharp method. You had an attribute on the top saying what language the body is in. Um, and then it would, then you would just write Java in the body, and the compiler would move that out to a Java file and would generate all the JNI calls to actually do that kind of stuff. And the, um, what do you call it? The coercing of values into the right things across the boundary. And um, we didn't do anything with complex objects because there isn't actually a good general solution for that. So we handled all primitive types. We allowed you to pass like C sharp functions up to Java and call them from there. They became action well, what's the actions and funks from c sharp became what were they i'm so glad i can't remember this stuff anymore it means most of the pain is starting to dissolve away i'll probably lose about five years of age as, as the java seeps out my system uh, java does not like code uh, yeah there is something to that there's so much crazy shit in java there's like little decisions that just don't kick your ass all day kick mine Ah, uh, yes. Still. Yeah, that was that. Um, 
I actually like the solution we came up with. It's something I, I would like to have in more languages is just a way of saying, hey, this function, like you would just, it would be a bit weird in this, but you would go, defun uh, foo x, y, and then you would say, um, like, declare bang java. And then the rest of this, the body of this function, would just be written in Java. Um, what's the bad part about JNI? It sounds worse, but you can also call C from Python, and that was rather painless. Ooh, okay, so um, let's go look. Let's go remind ourselves of the pain. I haven't done this in a while. Um, Uh, where is the actual fucking information? The first problem is Oracle. Um, so there's, uh, where, if I can't find signature, type signatures, here we go. Yeah. All of the t when you have to write um, like a function name, you can't just write like the name and then the argument types. They have to be like, yeah. If it's a boolean, then it's z. If it's byte, then it's b. And then if it's an object, oh yeah. If it's an array, it's uh, open bracket. There's no close bracket, and then the type. Um, so yeah, this oh, you can see it here actually. Here we go. This function f. This is its signature. And it just gets really, yeah, it's obviously really annoying to type this stuff. Um, you have to handle all the coercing, like when exceptions get raised, there's no actual error that propagates up. You, after every call, you need to check to see if the JNI is now in an invalid state, and then you have to deal with that. Um, there's some, you have, oh, let's see if I can remember this. You have a certain number of any reference you get back is temporary. Um, it's a local reference, if I remember correctly. And then, so that means that it only exists on that call stack. So if you store that in a variable and then you return, that thing is now invalid, right? So if you try and access that again, it will probably crash. Might not, might not, it's really good. It doesn't, it's like, it's fucking like dereferencing pointers. You just don't know what you're gonna get. Um, so you get that, so then you can um, turn those into global references and you have a maximum number of those. Oh, I can't remember. Oh man, this is, it's been a while. Um, local and global references. Yes. Local references are valid for the duration of a native method call. They're freed automatically after the re method re returns. I think it was maybe these that we have. Programs need to make sure that native methods do not excessively allocate local references. Um, yeah, there's a, like a fixed, it's a surprisingly low fixed number. It's just really easy to create leaks. Um, anytime you have a loop, you better be sure that you're releasing your references as you're handing things down. Um, it was very, very frustrating. Um, oh God, yeah. And then dealing with weak references. And you can pin things in the GC, which may, so we had this, we had, we had a tricky, we had a bunch of tricky cases. One of the things was you've got two GC languages and you want Java to be able to hold on to references to your, like the C-sharp language, and you want C-sharp to be able to hold on to references to the Java objects. So you get these really interesting situations where, like, if you pin the Java object, oh fuck, this is, this is I'm try, trying to remember the various cases that we had to go through. Let's see if I remember this right. Because when you make an object global, you pin it in GC, which means it can't get freed which means when the object that's holding onto it gets freed, then you need to change it. No, that's not right. That's not right. How do you... What was it? 
Ah, oh, I can't remember. Where was it? JMI types and blah blah blah. Yeah, global and local references. Let's look at pin. Oh, this is just oh, it's the same page. Oh yeah, it's just a different position on the fucking ugh, okay. Fine, yeah. Um so yeah, there's object pinning and all this other stuff that gets really interesting and um yeah, it was just super painful. I could dig back into that code to go through some of the stuff, but, um, yep. Um, hope you are not curious about that regarding the comments above. How do you mean, or are you talking to someone else? You're not curious about that regarding... Yeah, J and I is crazy painful. Um, you also, oh God. You need to get a... This is like therapy. <laughs> yeah, so most stuff takes... You have to get the VM. Yeah, whatever native thread you've got, you've got to attach to the Java thread. And then you can get this VM object that's needed in a whole bunch of places. Um, and so you have to have just, there's just loads of bootstrapping to get this set up right. But once you got it, like the way we had it set up was actually really nice. Um, if I can, I don't know if I can find any nice code. Let's look at fuse open foreign code. Wow, this has been maintained. Oh no, it's because I'm blocking shit. Nope, that's really bad. Okay, don't complain, Chris. Right, here we go. So what you would do is you would make a method and then you just say it's Java. And then you have these special braces, which just told the compiler to take this stuff raw. And then you write Java code inside. And that's all you would have to do. And we would take care of everything else. And the compiler generated loads of code to do all the bootstrapping. Oh, oh God, yeah, I forgot. There's so many things. Like you can't just, you have to, you have to query, you have to get like the class objects. You have to query to get the class object. Then you have to query that class object to get the methods. And then you can hold on to reference, but essentially these are method pointers. And then we, you can actually call them. And so our compiler would take this, move the Java code out to Java. We would generate all the tables for actually collecting all these function pointers. We'd cache them in sensible places and then we'd do all this nuts. Um, but yeah, this is like, this is how we would write code for dealing with different platforms. And so external iOS meant this code was only on, only compiled on iOS and this was only on Android. And so, yeah, this is how you would do a log that's actually using the, the system's log functions. And this is how we did all our bindings to various um, APIs. Did a lot of work in that shit. So if you return a, a Java object, we would give you this opaque object handle and all that kind of stuff. So that was really cool. Ooh. Anyway. Enough with that J and I nonsense. You got me on a, like there are some deep wounds there. You've just resurfaced for me. That was pain. Um, I would yeah. But but actually, one of the things that is interesting is bounds boundaries between languages are super interesting. If you do any research in those, let me know because I'm very very interested in that kind of stuff. Anywho, it's been a couple of hours. Thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, I'm glad we actually got some code done between me in between me rambling um, and. Um, yeah, this was fun. I will see you... Oh, will I see you next week? I don't know. I should be back in the country. Hey, actually, quick question. How many of you are going to ELS? Are any of you going to ELS? Because it's next Monday, Tuesday in Genoa in Italy. Going to be awesome. Um, I know that me and Shin and Mood are there. I'm pretty sure um, Marco is going to be there. Um, a lot of the normal crowd, hopefully. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um...
no thank you guys that's um been really cool and yeah Darius well I'm not going I'll be a stranger there we're all strangers there I don't think many of us live in Italy man but it's all right anyway I do have to go I'll catch you later thanks so much bye